Hey everyone! Hey everyone! We, we are back here live. live. <laughs> I, hope, I, hope, I hope everyone is doing all right. right. Um, I'm George, I'm George Sparks, the director of technology at Asus, and, and, and unlike before, we, we are actually live. live. We, we, I, 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 I could hopefully all hear me. All hear me. Oh, my audio is. Oh, my audio. One sec. Yeah. Hopefully, my audio is not echoing now. <laughs> Um, yeah, I hope everybody can can uh, hear me. We are actually live, unlike uh, before in our previous e sections, um, and I am actually talking to you. I can see y'all in the chat, so thank you for telling me I'm echoing. Um, but uh, we are live because we are doing our first live event of the Fe of Super Festival, and here we have a panel of amazing people here to talk about uh, reor and <laughs> reorienting how we play, accountability, healing, and restorative justice in games. So. So please give a warm hand eye society welcome to Honey, Kishana, JC, Javiera, and Aisha. Take it away, folks. Once I got to re enable the audio. Okay, yeah, All right. All right. Thank, Thank you so much, Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. yeah. Welcome, Welcome to, to this panel. panel. Uh, first, first of all, we're going to be discussing some potentially difficult topics that, that are still, still affecting many, many of us in development and play spaces. spaces. So, I as such, such, please check in with yourself, yourself and take the actions you need to prepare. prepare. You can mute you can the mute session. The session. Okay. Well, what was that? Oh, sorry. One oh, second. Sorry. One one second. second. There seems to be an echo. Um, anybody on the panel is I think that's probably that's probably it. Welcome to streaming. Welcome to streaming. We have, have all sorts of weird issues. <laughs> well, let's try this. How are we doing on sound? All right, how are we doing on sound? <laughs> we all good? We all good? All right, I think we are all headphoned up. All right, let's go. All right, great. So again, we're gonna be discussing some potentially difficult topics. Um, that are still affecting a lot of us in play and development spaces. As such, please check in with yourself and take the actions you need for your own care. You can mute the session, go for a walk, talk with a friend, do whatever it is you need to do. Secondly, our panelists have graciously offered to be here and share their wisdom and perspective. So when the floor is opened at the latter half of this talk, any questions aimed at insulting, trolling, humiliating, or otherwise not valuing their time and person will be dismissed. Uh, right up top before anything begins, I want to acknowledge that the land we are on and the peoples whose stories are tied to that land uh, are still present today. I'm coming to you, from you, to you from the Great Plains, which is a land that is the ancestral home of the Wichita, Kiowa, Tawakani, and Waco peoples. This land of armadillo and blue bonnet now carries the legacies of violence against these people that killed many and displaced generations from their ancestral home. I mention this because living where they once did, our stories are still tied to the by the land to theirs, and so is our liberation. If we have any desire for our descendants to see a thriving and peaceful future, we must continue to advocate for the return of, indi return of indigenous sovereignty, reconnect with the land we are on, work to heal and repair the harm done to native communities, listen to and learn from and support land back initiatives. This meeting is also facilitated by, by technology. We get to be here today because of the vast network of servers and companies allowing for the flow of digital information. These servers are located on stolen land 
built for minerals extracted through the exploitation of miners in Burundi, Uganda, Chile, just to name a few, and whose exhaust continues to push our planet into climactic retaliation. Our stories and liberation are also tied to theirs, to the bodies of black and brown people exploited to extract metal from the earth, and to the people fleeing their homes as the sea levels rise. I mention this to reinforce that our survival and salvation is interconnected, that until all of us are free and safe, none of our descendants can truly be. And that's what a lot of this conversation is going to be about, how we can use principles of restorative justice, healing justice, and transformative justice, principles that are often part of indigenous ways of living to help build us towards a more sustainable future for game makers and players, but these skills can also be used in our own communities. Uh, the past few years have been incredibly harrowing to say the least. They've exposed, illuminated, and in some cases exacerbated the difficulties and pains uh, that people face wherever they live, work, and play. Uh, for us who make play, this is really no different. We've experienced neglect from large organizations, abuse from those with power, policing and gatekeeping in our homes, play, and workspaces, disregard for our safety, and the continued undervaluing of our lives by the systems we exist within. Over this next hour, we're going to examine some of these violences, discuss their origins and effects, and set some definitions. And then we're going to share tools on recognizing patterns, working to repair ourselves and our communities, and envisioning and creating a future that we can all exist within. My name is Honey Rosenblum. I'm a queer cyborg mystic, play advocate, facilitator, mediator, herbalist in training, and executive director of currently on hiatus Friendship Garden Game Developers, which is a nonprofit organization trying to create a playful, gentle, inclusive, and sustainable future for the games industry. We root our work uh, in the experience uh, at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities, and we continue to organize events, interactive experiences, and other playful activations to deepen connection between self and other, to cultivate intimacy between us, land, uh, and the infinite that is being. And now I'll pass it off to my other wonderful panelists. Uh, JC, do you want to go first? Hello. I, so I'll just introduce myself. I, I just want to check that my audio is working fine. Um, I am Dr. JC Lau. I am currently a senior producer at Probably Monsters, working on an unannounced project. Before that, I was at Hairbrain Schemes, where I worked on Battletech, um, the core technologies team, and an unannounced project. Before that, I was at Bungie, where I am the founder of the Bungie Diversity Committee, and I also worked on Destiny 2 and its first year of expansions. Now, um, before I got into games, I was actually an academic. I was a college professor at Virginia Tech, where I taught moral, political, and legal philosophy. My area of specialization was collective decision-making processes and political representation. And before that, my very first job actually was as a family lawyer. So um, these ideas of justice and healing as a community are very important to me. So, hello. I guess I should throw it over to someone else. So, Kishana. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, JC, that's really what I'm on a chat. Here you come. Now, as soon as I start talking and you come, y'all be quiet now. I didn't know that, JC. I'm really glad to be here to share space with you all. Kishana Gray, Associate Professor in Writing, Rhetoric, and Digital Studies at the University of Kentucky. Um, I'm a I study like online communities, online interactions, the experiences of mar marginalized and minoritized people inside these spaces. Um, I'm also really interested in uh, seeing what the uh, esports and streaming uh, spaces look like, especially for um, those same folks. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'll send it over over to you, Javiera. Hello, uh, I'm Javiera. I'm a pronouncer she, her. I'm an associate producer at Threshold Games, where we are building a solar pump 4X city builder um, that is aiming to um, decolonize conventions of the genre um, and, um, and tell a meaningful story with that. Um, and I, I, you know, it's not fair to have to follow <laughs> such <laughs> luminaries. Um, what? Uh, I was a, a director of operations for a restaurant group before this, before coming to the game industry. Um, and um, something that I'm intensely passionate about is demystifying the 
hiring and recruiting process for uh, game studios as well as people looking for jobs in games. Yeah. To bring about just a more equitable uh, workforce. Yeah. Um, so. And how about you? Aisha? Yeah. Hi, folks. Uh, my name yeah. is Aisha Schilling Ford. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I am an artist, uh, designer, and cultural strategist, um, and the artistic director of Intelligent Mischief, which is a creative studio yeah. dedicated to unleashing Black imagination to shape the future. Yeah, love it. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. I'm so excited to be here with y'all today and to really yeah. be in this conversation. So since this panel is focused on harm and transformation, let's start with definitions so that everyone understands the context that we're working from. How would you define harm? And feel free to use experiences and examples that uh, you've seen or face. Right. I appreciate you asking that question. And I think it's a good place to start um, because I know we have, you know, some general conceptions of like what harm is, especially like in the gaming space, right? Um, but I also think that some of those definitions are pretty limiting, right? Because a lot of them, you know, talk about like individual infractions, individual like offending. And, you know, all those are very like important and very significant. I think that if we were to spend more time really like at the structural and institutional level and thinking about, you know, the harms that are enabled by individual like users, you know, if we look at like structural approaches, I think we can get like a lot farther, which this discussion will unveil, you know, some of those, the limits of interventions, the limits of like approaches um, because of how limiting, you know, these spaces are. Um, and so whenever we think about, you know, like harms, like I really, I, I bring it down to the, to the simplest term terms, the reduction of joy in the space, that, that simple as that, right? If there is a reduction of harm, I mean, a reduction of joy, if something is taking my joy, impacting my joy inside the space, then a harm is being done. Like as simple as that, right? And then uh, of course, you know, a, a person's, uh, you know, that reduction of joy means different things for different people. But I think just starting like at that definition, I think it generates plenty of conversations and plenty of things to talk about. Also just to keep it as inclusive like as possible. And then we you know we can branch off and talk about like different reductions of joy and what that actually means. So that's what that's what it mean, means for me. Yeah. And that's, I just want to jump on that because I think it's really interesting you define this as a reduction of joy because the game space is about joy. Like as game makers, yeah. we are basically yeah. digital toy makers. We are purveyors of joy yeah. and our work should also be joyful. So to define harm in this way is really interesting because it is so it just goes so against how, like, what we are doing and the products we are creating and, like, the reason why we are here. And yeah. so, for me, harm is, all, like, all those things, but I think it is yeah. also something about, like, you know, if we were to talk about the institutional and structural um, systems yeah. under which we create joy, harm is what happens yeah. when we have collectively failed to protect someone or something Ooh. that causes this risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to emphasize the collective nature of it, just because yeah. game making is very oftentimes a collective, it's a collaborative process. It requires multiple people working together. And when we have collective, when we are working collectively, then there are also points of collective failure. And that is something I hope that we can address today as well. Um, I can, I can share a bit like, um, and I really appreciate the reflections, especially in the context of gaming. Um, I'm, I think I'm the only person on the panel that's not in the gaming industry. So thinking about the context that I, um, am mostly coming from, it's from, you know, climate environmental justice yeah. work and right. domestic violence prevention work and economic justice work. Yeah. Um, so when I was reflecting on how I was understanding harm, I thought about it as either the intentional or unintentional, like crossing of emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, social, yeah. economic, um, et cetera, boundaries sure. yeah. um, in a way that separates um, an, the, the being that is harmed from their inherent wholeness, safety, or right to self-determination, <laughs> whether that is a living being, a land, a community, um, et cetera. Um, so just thinking, I think like really focusing on, um, especially in the context of this panel, that harm is both, can be both an action 
that is done intentionally or unintentionally, but is also right. an experience yeah. of the person yeah. who's, who's sort of been uh, sort of separated um, or whose boundaries yeah. have been crossed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think of harm as um, a, an isolating experience that diminishes a person's sense of well-being or a sense of safety or a sense of belonging. And, um, and, and that can be diminished across emotional levels. It can be diminished across um, a sense of physical safety. Um, but I think psychological safety is, is often where harm is perpetuated to consolidate power. Yeah, I like these definitions as they are yeah. really focusing on the experience of the person that has been harmed because ultimately yeah. that's where harm is recognized is in, in the, the individuals that have been harmed. Right. Um, right. And Kishana, you mentioned that like there is this sort of collective harm that happens uh, by existing inside of these systems uh, that these systems right. enable. So um, I think that there are these two really interesting cases right. of harm that become really hard to identify, which is one, when we've been sitting inside of a system for so long, we've normalized its messages and it's yeah. hard for us to see how it harms us. And then yeah. two, when there's an individual that uh, has caused some harm to happen and it is also enabled and normalized right. by these systems so that we almost don't necessarily recognize that it is an That's aberration right. and often blame the one person instead of looking at the larger right. systems at play. Yeah. So I yeah. think the question we have here is how do we recognize uh, when harm has happened both within ourselves and how do we tie it and recognize which systems are at play when it does happen? Mm -hmm. I think that's such a good question, honey, you know, because at first, especially like in, you know, I'm, I'm in the console gaming space like a whole lot. Like I'm looking at like interactions in that space. And early on, whenever I was trying to like do like a lot of research, especially like for, you know, graduate school, you know, dissertation work, you know, I wanted like a question that I asked people, I asked them all, like, when was the first time you experienced uh, harm? Uh, when was the last time and when was the worst time, right? Now, if I were to go back and do this again, I'm like, I don't know why I rooted it in that, right? It was so awful, like, to just talk about the harms, right? But but what I found in that was that what I defined as harm was not the same as, like, what somebody else, like, would define as harm. And I'll use, like, you know, for, for example, like, you know, the N-word. You know, honey, you just talked about like the normalization of things like in space. Like we had, we've normalized sexism. We've normalized racism. We've normalized like all these awful things inside like the gaming space. And so whenever I was talking, you know, specifically like to, uh, to, to black men um, about like their experiences or, like around these things, they were like, that's no big deal. That's just trash talking, right? They lumped it under that umbrella, not even realizing, you know, that that was like a harm that was done to them because they were like, well, that's just what the gaming space is. So just trying to like break down, you know, that the complexities of that alone so they can realize like they're, they're being harmed because I think for a lot of them, um, especially with how, you know, their masculinity is like set up, they didn't want to admit that a harm had happened to them because that was for them or a lot of these cis -het, het black men, they were like, you know, that's a sign of weakness, you know? And I was like, where do I even go to start if you don't even define this thing as something that, that was awful that happened to you that was even like a harm? And they was like, well, that's just what being like black in America is. They have normal like because of that that metric, the litmus test is just so so high or subterranean. I don't even even know which way. Like it's probably low. The bar is low, you know, especially with the everydayness of microaggressions that you know all you know that we experience. So um, I, I think really just trying to to say, hey, you can say you've been harmed. Like just getting people to just admit that something had happened. But I also you know so it, that that was a struggle. So that I'll put that out there. I'll, I'll stop right there. But I appreciate you asking that that, honey. Um, I'm struck how much that example, Kishana, like reminds me of um, of what, when I was doing work in the intimate partner violence prevention yeah. space, yeah. Mm. and how mm. much uh, you know just some of the same patterns yeah. of um, the shame, um, you know, not yeah. wanting to admit harm or right. ad admit being um, susceptible That's to right. harm. Yeah. Um, or not finding uh, an environment that creates a space for right. yeah. for talking about it. Um, so a lot of like social pressure not to. 
Um, and I and when I think about those similarities, like I think about things like, you know, when that that it's often that people who are abused like sometimes don't because it is so normalized as as we all mentioned. Yeah. Don't notice it as abuse. It's just what life is like. Um, but in working with yeah. with people who had experienced abuse, like often inviting people to ask, like, do I feel like I have agency? Like, do I have the? I feel yeah. like I can yeah. make choices. Um, do yeah. I feel safe? Um, do I feel um, like self determined? And can I? Do I feel like yeah. like that there's enough spaciousness in my life yeah. to fulfill my fullest potential? And that. Right. Often when those kinds of questions are considered, like that's when people realize, oh, this this is a scenario in which there is some kind of pattern of abuse um, or pattern of, of harm. Um, and that those things, agency, safety, self-determination, and the ability to a- achieve my full potential are inherent rights. So if those things are missing, I'm being harmed in this situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up? Yeah, I'm yeah. curious just to follow from what you just said, Aisha. Um, the like, like when, when harm is perpetrated or abuse is perpetrated, um, I'm curious if like, like the person the that is the like, like the, the subject, subject of that, that is, yeah, you know, tr- trying to you know not claim that it is abuse or harm just because yeah. that is the piece of control right. that they have over. Like it's like I can control that narrative right. about like what is being Ooh. done to me. And if I'm not naming it as harm, mm-hmm. then it's not harm, right? Like, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I th- so I think one of the big things here, like the yeah. challenge, is really naming the thing, like giving right. it a name, it, like make makes it real in a way. And I know also in the games industry there are these very big legal and structural obstacles to being able to do this. Like, I'm just thinking about, like, the fact that anti-disparagement agreements exist when people are let go from studios or, you know, Mm. there are gag orders that are put on people for, you know, or people are told not to talk to the press. Like, there are these processes and systems that have been put in place to prevent people from being able to name things as harm. And it's only in very recent years that we're starting to see a trend where people can still... Like people are starting to overcome this, but it is challenging because we are dealing with these very big yeah. structural processes that have been in place for decades, to tr- and we have to like push against that in order, to, in order to even recognize that this thing that has happened is harm. So, yeah, that that's all I wanted to add. And and, and I do think that that is like a crucial step that is often overlooked in in, in yeah. cases of mediation or in cases of. Um, a company like a game studio trying to support um, an employee that has experienced harm and has reported it as harm is that even the um, the like mutual collective acknowledgement and agreement of naming the behavior that caused yeah. the harm and separating the yeah. behavior apart from the person who committed it so that you are able to mm-hmm. zoom out a little mm-hmm. bit and and identify like what was the what was like the root unmet need that this person was faced with that like they chose to have like compensating behavior as a means of of meeting that need in a way that was going to like cause harm intentionally or unintentionally as like a side effect and often people who are are you know who have caused harm or who are actively causing harm, they don't see it as such. That's right. Um, they That's see right. it as um, either, oh, this is a last resort or, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And they can't even agree on that like reality. So establishing a shared reality and um, believing someone's experience and giving someone the space and time to reflect yeah. internally for themselves what that experience was enough so that they can um, like adequately describe what that experience was and then have yeah. that like shared reality establishing. Right. Um, yeah. it's, it's a crucial step. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think on that note of just trying to establish that shared reality, um, we're gonna move into the sort of transformation section of our talk, which is, yeah defining what it means, what transformative justice means, uh, what it means for us, and like how 
we can use it's the tools that are present in movement spaces and violence prevention spaces yeah. and abolition spaces for our companies to create a shared reality, yeah. to hold one another accountable and to create uh, community accountability processes and other processes that can work towards repair. Yeah. So uh, let's start with a definition. What is transformative justice, restorative justice, uh, healing justice, whatever? There are differences in between those, but whatever which ones you prefer to use. And why is it an important framework for you? Gosh. This is, this is a hard one. So I know that there are actual definitions that exist, right? But I also want to root, you know, how I define it in like the realities of how hard it has been to implement these things in spaces, right? Yeah. So I'm going to just go with what, what I see from the struggles of like, you know, the, all these decades of shared experience that we have like across us, right? I, I think it's the, the intentionality of trying to not only just like fix a problem, but also identify the root cause of the problem. Like I really had to like break it down like as simple as that for a lot of these, you know, like in academic spaces and like these these tech spaces, because I'm, I'm just even thinking about, you know, a lot of these frameworks, which a lot of these folks are going to be talking about here, you know, for, for the audience. Um, we're in most of these tech spaces, we're not even ready to begin at step one of what we see like in like the community, you know, activism kinds of spaces. But just identifying that there is a problem is really a huge step for like a lot of these companies. And I know that's sad, but I'm just going to go with, with what reality is just identifying a problem and maybe identifying like some, you know, like, like some intentions behind trying to fix that problem. One thing I, I'd like to add to that also is the idea of restorative justice being, and like like we talked about, it is a very like nebulous concept. It has different meanings. Like from like I have a legal background, and it has a very different definition there right. from like you know a political philosophy background, yeah. or, and yeah. also in the game space, it means something very different. Yeah. But um, just if I were to abstract that into a you know, into a one sentence blurb about what we're talking about when, um, when I say restorative yeah. justice, I'm talking about having a system of justice that like, if you compare that, you know, or contrast that with a punitive system, it's looking at a yeah. systemic solution to uh, what Javier has called an unmet need. It's yeah. a yeah. way of giving space to yeah. both the perpetrator and the victim and in the context of a community. Um, this is why when we were talking about harm, I said harm is a collective failure because the system yeah. is built by the community and the community yeah. has failed to do something to protect the person who yeah. Yeah. had harm inflicted on them. So it is on the community to mend that. It is not like, you know, it is not just on the perpetrator. Like the perpetrator yeah. is a part of the system sure. and we need to understand yeah. all those moving parts together. And so yeah. when we talk about, um, when we talk about like, restoring justice, what we mean here right. is really yeah. having a process by which all the parties, including the community as a whole, yeah. have space to understand what has happened and can move forward together from that. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think of restorative or transformative justice as a means of equipping all parties involved with better tools and language and like tools of communication, tools to um, identify like harm at earlier stages. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I look at transformative justice as um, a more equitable redistribution of power so yeah. that those, those extreme power divides do not um, yeah continue to engender the same patterns of behavior by providing protections to the people causing harm um, and by making it even more dangerous and more vulnerable for a person who is experiencing harm to even identify it publicly as, hey, this is harm, hey, this is an injustice and I need support. Yeah. Um, I... As, as y'all were speaking, I was thinking about um, kind of like the, this, especially what you were just saying, Javier, around like the tools to um, intervene or prevent harm like earlier on. And I was thinking a little bit about the, almost the inevitability of harm. 
um, especially mm. unintentional because of not yeah. not knowing everyone's boundaries ahead of time. Like there's a high chance right, of, yeah. of um, creating a separation or, or unintentionally crossing boundaries or what have you. Um, so I was thinking about restorative or transformative justice almost as like, like a set of rituals or practices yeah. where we're sort of always engaging in sort of re reaffirming of those boundaries and supporting a return to wholeness um, yeah. in a yeah. kind of um, regular, you know, often something we do often all the time. Like I think about like, um, I have a pair of uh, nibblings, like um, they're four years yeah. old. And oh. sometimes, we, you know, like you unintentionally hurt their feelings yeah. or like, you know, <laughs> and it's going to happen all the time. <laughs> like, yeah. as you just learn who these people are becoming. And so that yeah. kind of like practice of supporting that return to, yeah. to wholeness, mm. um, you know, within communities and so on feels uh, was what was coming up for me. So. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I especially love the concept of, of returning to wholeness and, and this, yeah. this term of restitution. Um, and it's easy to uh, stumble over like what that looks like of yeah. if someone has, yeah. you know, has experienced harm. And there are often cases where loss is experienced and it, on the surface, it, it could be perceived that there, there is no path backward that like, sometimes yeah. scars are yeah. left and and right. and it is a very right. disembodying experience and it can often feel like yeah. there isn't there like there's no home to return to yeah but when i think about yeah. being made whole i think about wholeness as our own innate dignity yeah. and yeah. our own innate um our potential and to yeah. be restored to a to a status that we are able to be present with ourselves and able to um, be present right. in an environment that is conducive to safety, so that we can come back right. to play, and right. we can come back to um, uh, yeah. an environment that it is safe to strategize and safe to reflect. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one thing also that's yeah. interesting about when we talk about restorative justice is it is this idea of coming back to a place of safety, but it is also very future looking. We're also looking at how do mm -hmm. we make things better for yeah. like, how do we reduce trauma for future generations? How do we, do, you know, constantly improve. And now I'm just going to very quickly put on my producer hat because yes. this is what producers yeah. do all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we talk about retrospectives. Like we, like when a milestone in, you know, our game project has passed or at the end of a sprint or whatever, we talk about what went well, what, what could have gone better and like any yeah. action items we yeah. can take from that. And this is very structurally similar to a restorative justice process where we look at what has happened and we say, okay, what are the things that we, we want to make better? Like, what are the things we can do to make better? What are the tools that we have that we can use to, you know, do these things to make people's lives better, to reduce the amount of harm that has been done, to pave the way to make a brighter and more sustainable and safer future for like, you know, your studio, your community, your industry, whatever it is. And, but we need to have both of those steps. We need to look into the past to see what has happened, to know where to go in the future. And these things are all connected. Yeah. I think that leads in really great to the next question we have, which is when we think about transformation, envisioning and imagining futures is sometimes an incredibly powerful first step in creating yeah. action and guiding us towards uh, a vision. Um, I'm going to pass this off to Aisha because I know this is a thing that you have incredible experience with, but like, what has your experience with been with imagining futures? Uh, what skills do you use and what sort of techniques do you have in creating these sort of collective visions of something that's more preferable um, and possible? Um, I also just wanted to briefly add a final thought on the topic of uh, transformative justice that for me, it is, uh, the, the, it is predicated on the notion that none of us are disposable. Mm. And I think that is something mm -hmm. that the economic right. models that um, nations Ooh. and communities Ooh. have depended on for so long around like That's right. imperialist, like white supremacist capitalism. That's right. That's um, right. They teach us that like, oh, if our, 
if our game That's studio, right. if one of our engineers is causing a problem, let's just fire her. We can mm. hire a new engineer. Um, yeah. And they yeah. don't realize that like, it's not just That's right. the destruction of that one person's life, That's right. but it is all the lives that that person touches. That's and it right. Is all of the myriad like tangential relationship that that person That's right. holds. That's right. And so um, my favorite thing about transformative yeah. justice is that yeah. it cannot exist in a world where we can throw someone away. That's right. That there is a tomorrow. That's and right. That that person, absolutely, that their their body is still here. Yeah. And how can we honor the dignity and the yeah. infinitude of this yeah. person and all that they could be capable capable of? Yeah. Um. How could we honor yeah. that if we just stop at a, a penal reaction? Right. Of yeah, like oh, you made this person suffer, and so now you too must suffer. Mm, mm -hmm, it's it's, it's mm -hmm, dehumanizing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Beautiful. But I'm sorry to. No, it's all good. No, that's really that's like um just making me reflect um as, real quickly before I talk about visioning yeah. the futures is just making me reflect yeah. on. Um, the assumption of the capacity of an individual to want to want to repair the harm, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. and maybe mm -hmm. that our systems sort of don't leave space for that. You know, it, it made me think of people who, when they have committed harm and sort of like faced face that that sometimes they want to separate from community for a little while so that they can sort of navigate whatever in them. You know. Yeah. Um, brought that into being so yeah, I, yeah it's just, I, just an image of that like kind of yeah. popped yeah. up um, for me so thank you for that Absolutely. um also real quickly in terms of imagining futures like to be like super honest like um the, the approach that we use at, at intelligent mission for imagining futures is probably an approach that we um were introduced to through um yes. fantasy and gaming we use world building um yeah. The reason we use it is because we were creating um, a project in 2015 called the Black Body Survival Guide, and we wanted yeah. to make it something similar to the Zombie Apocalypse Survival Guide. So yeah. we wanted to make it a bit satirical, yeah. and because we wanted to sort of highlight the absurdity of racism in a so-called post-racial society. So we wanted to sort of suggest that there are no tools for someone who experiences the harm yeah. of racism to avoid being harmed by racism. Right. Like, right. you know, and, right. and sort of push back on this idea that there are things you can do, you know, similar right. to like, there are things you can do to prevent assault. Mm. Like, it's mm -hmm. like, no, that's not on you. Right. Like, um, you know, so <laughs> right. we were sort of dealing with that and we were writing these chapters about different forms of structural racism in different institutions, like um, in yeah. the, you know, in the carceral institutions, in education, in uh, climate, like the intersection of gender and race, uh, and race and racism, and so on. And when we were writing the chapter on police brutality on carceral states, we couldn't get to like a satirical voice because it was yeah. too close. You know, like people yeah. were yeah. writing their anger into the into the chapter. So we we asked ourselves like who would we have to be and, and where would we have to have come from for us to kind of objectively write about um, you know, structural uh, racism in, in the carceral state. And so we realized that we had to like build a whole world with a set of characters who had never experienced that, but kind of yeah. knew about it from a distance. And so yeah. we did you know, some world building um, to create an entire you know, a society that had never experienced yeah. um, either yeah. enslavement or colonialism so that people in that society could sort of look from afar at what was happening and sort of have this kind of more clinical yeah. objective voice right. that from which we could then draw a satirical voice. Yeah. Um, so, you know, subsequently we've just integrated um, world building as the core tool for imagining and envisioning futures. And we, we um, sort of um, combine that with transformative movement building and transformative strategy that was taught to us by Norma Wong of the Chosen G mm -hmm. uh, Temple in 
um, yeah. Hawaii, and um, she's a Zen Buddhist priest that had been, and a political strategist, and had been a mentor to many social movement organizations for several years. And um, she introduces this approach to transformative strategy that invites you to envision of a long arc future, like a hundred year future. Um, and so imagine um, what you want the future of, of your descendants, whether uh, descendants in your community or in your own family and so on, what you want the future of those people to be a hundred yeah. years from now. So essentially seven generations from now yeah. to yeah. practice That's right. writing stories of beautiful futures that are the result of work that we do now so that's that's really what we draw on is it's storytelling and world building and centering the people who will inherit like this land from us and sort of putting ourselves in the position of being responsible ancestors who are dreaming wild for their yeah. descendants yeah um yeah yeah I'll pause yeah. there. I love it. I love it. I, lo I love that last line. That the the words like yeah. popped up in my head of like, like conducting ourselves properly as stewards for the future. Yeah, one thing I see about us all, all doing this work and just collectively like where the industry is going and how we kind of carry ourselves forward is what we're doing really right now is we're planting seeds for trees under whose yeah. shade we will never sit. Like this is work for future yeah. generations. And yeah, I really love right. that we're talking about like, not just right. the next generation of people that come into this industry, but like seven yeah. generations out, like what, like what would yeah. that even look like? And it's wonderful just to think about like yeah. the, like pl the multitudes of like possibility we have for what that space would look like and how bright yeah. that future could be if we take yeah. certain steps today. Yeah, I'm so excited for us to to reduce our vocabulary of the k kinds of harm that we see. Yeah, I think that it is possible. I think that it is possible to yeah. equip ourselves with language to adequately describe the experiences we're going through, and look at a piece of harm and go, "We don't need to. Uh, we don't need to do that anymore." Yeah, right. We don't need to yeah. have pay disparities between genders yeah yeah right we, we don't need to hire all right. white men right 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 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm i work a lot in the i think i'm not gonna say i've given up on adults but i thank you all for this reframing that y'all given me about like planting you know the seeds for trees that were never set up on you know thank you all like for that because that really helps me a lot um but i also i'm thinking about like in a space you know i often work like with with kids a whole lot mm. you know kids who are you know existing and living in a world that wants to harm them every day that doesn't want to, you know doesn't want them to thrive you know and especially queer kids kids of color trans kids you know and you know they're always like well what what can be done now what can happen now so i was like well i think one of the useful things that i'm thinking about what aisha just said you know, I often think about like world building with kids and we have some beautiful frameworks and templates from games, you know, that we can like employ and utilize. So I know when I'm working, working like with kids, you know, we often like imagine like a world. I'm like, okay, what's going to be your role in this world? You know, of course, you know, you can pick from like the healer and the mage, you know, you can pick from those kinds of things, but these are all also all roles that there, there are no destructive ends in them. You know, there's no, you know, like you either are going to build or rebuild a new world um, or, or, or you're going to destroy it, you know, and nobody wants to say, well, I want to destroy it, but I make them have to pick the role, like to say, okay, which one are you actually like going to do? You know, so we do have some really beautiful models, you know, for us to like rethink what it could be. And I really just want to give like kids hope, you know, give them, you know, just like this template of like, we can kind of create it, you know, like, like right now, but really thank y'all for that, for that. Cause I, I give, I give up on adults a whole lot. I'm like, I'm tired of y'all. <laughs> you know, so y'all are, y'all are amazing. I'm learning so much from y'all here. Thank you. So we've talked sort of about the frameworks of, of what restorative justice might be, how we could get together and envision what the future of game making and what the future of our communities might be. But let's talk about some of the, the tangible things we can do. Uh, earlier, Kishana mentioned, and I think it's very true that like, really the first step is just even getting people to admit or companies to admit that like something has been done wrong. What are some of the, the techniques and ways that we can build into our companies, into our studios, uh, this sort yeah. of process of 
acknowledging, recognizing, and restoring harm. <clears throat> yeah. I'm going to start because you brilliant minds are going to have way more beautiful things to say here. But yeah. I'm going to, like, I'm at a point where I am getting tired of the apology um, mm -hmm. and because the apology is like the, the template that most of these companies, that's the only thing they got. Right. Um, and then we try to say, well, there are, there are other things that we should and could implement. I'm like, okay. Cause the apology is just step one. That's like the first start. And then a lot of people are like, okay, we apologize. We're done. Right. No, sir. <laughs> like, no, not at all. Um, and I think that's like one of the hardest things because, you know, so many of these institutions, and I'm speaking also from like an academic space, because there's a lot, you know, work in, you know, academia where we have all of these awful yeah. folks who have done so much harm. You know, we've got predators who are still like teaching classes and have access to like students. And, you know, they're like, well, well, they're off, you know, we're not putting them in the classroom. So that's good enough. No, that's not good enough. You know what I'm saying? But I also want to think about the model where I think about, okay, these folks are not disposable. How do we actually, you know, that change behavior? Absolutely, Javier. How can we change the, that, that behavior? And I'm stumped on that part. I don't mm. know because also I'm just like, get rid of them dispose of them you know because we i don't know what else to do because under because i think also the models that we have right now are very limiting they're prohibitive and so it's hard because they're not uh, and we have these beautiful you know abolition models we have models where they can implement but they're they're not there yet so you know i think a lot of us are operating under like the systems that we're in and right now it's just to just dispose of people but that's not fixing the like the problem at all and so i think i'm stuck there i'm, I'm stuck there i'll be honest something that I come back to is, is that um, a, like a game studio may like have someone who commits sexual assault or harassment. Yeah. And then they're like, Oh, this person is the problem. Let's penalize them. And even if they are defanged and thrown yeah. away, like it is a very presumptuous notion that, each of us are yeah. immune to that behavior, that we are immune to be, to like reactionary behavior that's going to compensate for unmet needs. Like we are all human. And yeah. I, I, I come back to that, like we are not disposable and that like the wellness and the happiness and sense of belonging yeah. and, and, ability to be believed as capable of changing. I think yeah, be, yeah. like being yeah. seen as someone who's capable of change is something that often people who cause harm are robbed of. Yeah. They're robbed of that humanity. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, like for, for me, like what to, to the, the initial question of, mm -hmm. of like, well, like, what do we, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think back to mm -hmm. um, how, like if a policy is put you in could, place, you want to do something? Uh, often a company will like draft guidelines for uh, conduct of the employee and the, the way that an employee mm -hmm. is onboarded is they're like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. Here's your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Here's how you're going to do those tools. Here's how you use those tools. But none of it is given focus on here's how we treat each other. And here is what the process looks like. If someone has committed harm, here is how we yeah. define harm. Here is here are the frameworks that we can lean on to support all of us right. when this invariably happens. Because people look at harm as a well, if harm happens, and instead, yeah. Yeah. what if we start looking at it as when harm happens? Yeah. This is what we can do. Right. And right. You know, step one That's could right. be That's like right. the cessation of that harm, of yeah. stopping the harm. And yeah. yeah. So I want to go back to something Kishana mentioned about academia because I was also in the academic space and basically my transition from academia into the games industry was basically trading, working with toxic old white men to working with toxic slightly yeah. less old white men. So that's kind of where I'm coming yeah. from. Yeah. Um, yeah. But okay, so in academia, there's a concept of tenure, which is basically when a professor reaches a particular stage of their like you yeah. know academic experience they basically yeah. get a job at an institution and they can stay there for the rest of their lives and in these cases like you run into these situations where people 
can perpetrate all kinds right. of harm, mm. but because they have this particular status, it's almost yeah. like, oh, well, they contribute so much to the university and the oh academic gosh. field, so we can't get rid of them. Like, oh my gosh. And oh my gosh. in a way, that's very similar to, like, in games, we have this idea, albeit very, very wrong, but <laughs> this idea of rock stars, right? It's like a rock star yeah. is someone that is so valuable to your company that no yeah. matter what they do, you cannot get rid of them. And first of all, that is absolute bullshit. Like, right. like no one is above anyone else in that way. That's right. Um, the definition of rock stars in its very own concept devalues the right. like contributions of other people. Yeah. And it's just a very like, I, I don't know. I don't want to say fucked up, but it's a very yeah. fucked up concept that we just think this is just an acceptable norm that someone is more important than someone else because of this yeah. and um and i think part of the reason that like we yeah. you know we talked at the start about just you know we come into these harmful like environments and we just kind of internalize this and it just becomes this very normalized thing yeah i think part of i think that's where we need to start is like why is it the case that when we come into these spaces we are handed down these policies and these tools and like, you know, these systems where we just have to accept them. Like, what if we didn't, like, we can't, like, we cannot consent to our own oppression, right? Like that just doesn't make, like, why would we want to do that? And when I'm talking about these systems, what I'm talking about are things like, you know, I talked about anti-disparagement agreements before, like, you know, we can't name the harm if we can't talk, like, you know, we, if we literally cannot name the harm. Um, things like mandatory mediation, like, why do, like, why do we have this, like, power dynamic system where w the person that is ha having harm perpetrated on them has to consent to going through this traumatic process. Right. And right. the lack of consent for people in these situations for being able to like, you know, I guess it's like they, when you enter the games industry, a lot of times yeah. you are trying to just get a job yeah. and you will consent to whatever That's right. consent That's right. to whatever you because will. you want to get a job. You and <laughs> well, well. what, I want to do is challenge that, the nature of that consent because it's not real consent. It is, there is a mm -hmm. massive power dynamic that is happening there that like you cannot overcome just by getting someone to sign a piece of paper. And I don't mm -hmm. mean just NDAs, mm -hmm. I mean all the, mm -hmm. like, you know, the entire mm -hmm. policy. That's and right. this is pervasive across our industry. And I think that's where we need to start is looking at right. that and looking at how we get genuine consent from people for the practices and the policies because that gives them buy-in to the norms of that studio, the yeah. norms of that community. And that is where you really need to start. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when people, like when you have buy-in from people in, you know, in your team, in your company, in your studio, it, like when a person, when you have a person's consent, yeah. you have their spirit, you have their motivation, you have yeah. their heart. You have their ear. You also, you mm -hmm. have their genius. You have their feedback, mm -hmm. their, mm -hmm. their ability mm -hmm. to, to call things out that mm -hmm. maybe don't mm -hmm. need to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I think people rush things. They, 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 they rush to build companies and studios and they go, oh, we're, we're going to start a studio and we're going to hire 30 people this year. And that's mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. many people. And that's even small for many companies. Yeah. Um, so I, I yeah. think like scoping down and slowing down and yeah. really taking the time, yeah. uh, treating, Ooh. yeah, treating the, 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 the culture of establishing consent and like collective permission, yeah. Yeah. um, to, yeah. to operate with each other yeah. under a set of like mutually mm -hmm. agreed societal frameworks. That is the yeah. first crucial step. And I think that mm -hmm. um, there, there, we could be doing a better job of being yeah. slower about that and a yeah. better job of establishing like yeah. even just like a minimum requisite like minimum requisite prerequisites yeah. for what is like mm -hmm. how can a company be ethical yeah yeah in this process yeah 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 we're almost out of time Aisha did you want to add anything to this oh yeah. I was gonna go exactly yeah. where Javier went around yeah. um you know thinking about like you know, obviously, like capitalism makes it such that any kind of company will find it um, right. inconvenient to slow down and right. and deal with harms, right. except in the area of liability, and they'll try to like push it to to liability as you know, make it an HR issue as much as possible. Um, you know, but I get to I think fantasize about 
structures that um, support more collaboration, more collective decision making, um, and that shift some of the power dynamics that mm. are often the the or often just create space for for harm. You know, like hierarchical <laughs> power dynamics and so on. They yeah. just humans humans have a tough time not harming folks when they have a lot of power. Um, and so if you can yeah. like sort of spread that power around a bit, yeah. Um, you know, and I think about yeah. you know holacracies and other cooperatives, you know, employee owned um, structures and so on that might yeah. help at least shift the power dynamics and reduce some of the harms that are yeah. due yeah. Um, to power. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it would take a lot of slowing down. So that's yeah. why it's hard. Like <laughs> existing companies would be like, wait, we gotta like make more collaborative decisions. That's not very efficient. Um, <laughs> So slowing yeah. down would have to be a shared agreement yeah. across, Ooh. not just in one company. It would have to be a, a, a it have to be a culture shift in our society. Ooh, that, I think. What? Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say real quick on the business side of this, like you know, in terms of like you know, we live in a capitalist society and people need to frame this in business terms. Like this is an investment, right? We are investing in the future of this industry. That's so right. like that's right. If anything, that yeah. is the argument for doing this: is we are investing right. in a brighter future for. Our, like not just ourselves, but future generations of devs. And if that yeah. means we have to slow down now, like we're trying to play the long game here. You know? yeah. So it's yeah. like, we need to do that now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry that we're out of time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I'm also sorry to chat that we weren't able to get to your questions. If you have any, go ahead and just post them and I'll see if we can get to them later. Um, again, this has just been really scratching the surface of potentially beginning to change how we create play and running the industry. And yeah, just thank you all for being here and sharing your wisdom and sharing your time and space. Uh, it's been really incredible. Uh, we actually have a link with resources. Um, if you want to do further reading, that we'll go ahead and post. And yeah, feel free to follow us on the socials and yeah. drop any questions you have in the chat. Again, yeah. thank you so much for your presence. Are we still alive?